Good afternoon, international comrades and to our migrante kababayan. Magandang gabi naman po sa inyo dyan sa Pilipinas at mapagpalaya pagbati para sa ating lahat. Before we start, we would like to take a moment to express our deepest condolences to the daughter, family, and friends of Karapatan human rights defender Zara Alvarez, who was murdered by alleged state forces last August 17 on her on her way home in Bacolod City after receiving continuous death threats and being included to hundreds of black propaganda materials from the state. And the attack of the government does not dress as death threats. State surveillance and attacks are continuously received by human rights defenders, activists, and peasant leaders in the Philippines. It is now urgent and a must to stand up now and claim justice for Zara Alvarez and all the slain victims of the terrorist fascist regime. Join the people's struggle, overthrow the terrorist regime, advance the National Democratic Revolution. Anyway, going back, welcome to the National Democratic Online School, the uh, basic principles of Marxism and Leninism on political economy. Last week, we have discussed uh, the basic principles um, on the dialectical materialism. So if you have missed it, uh, oh, sorry, in historical materialism. So if you have missed it, you can find it posted on our page, Anakbayan Europa. So today, we would continue the discussion in discussing the uh, political economy. Magtutuloy-tuloy pa rin po ito until next week, August 31. Kaya um, uh, make sure to note this on your calendars and catch updates on our Facebook group, and the Lion Online. At... Uh, patuloy po tayo mag-imbita uh, ng ating mga kaibigan at kapamilya para makasali at makilam sa ating diskusyon. If you have a questions to Prof, uh, Professor Joma, please just drop it on the chat box or the comment box. And later after the discussion, we will have a question and answer portion in which Tito Jo can answer your portion. Mga kasama, let's start the discussion. Please welcome Professor Joma Sison. Hi Tito, mapulang pagbati po para sa inyo. Kamusta po kayo? Mahalab na revolusyonaryong pagbati sa iyo, Kaanghelo. At sa lahat ng kasapi at uh, kaibigan ng anak bayan Europe. Ayun. Tito, let's start the discussion. Um, the first question would be, in um, what is political economy? A political economy may be defined as the study of the fundamental laws of motion of the whole economy of a society. There are mountains of economic data about uh, uh, economic activities, but uh, uh, such can be subjected to research, analysis, and generalization for the purpose of theorizing <clears throat> and policy making. The classical British economists were the first to establish the subject of political economy as a field of study. <clears throat> In the latter half of the 18th century and in the early 19th century, with his book, A Wealth of Nations, in 1776, Adam Smith was the earliest classical economist to make the most comprehensive and coherent presentation of capitalism at the stage of free competition. He pointed to labor as the source of value in the commodity, but was mainly concerned with the important role of the market, especially with the so-called invisible hand of self-interest resulting supposedly in the common public good. David uh, Ricardo elaborated on the labor theory of value and explained the different, differing interest of the workers, entrepreneurs, and landlords to the worker. Uh, um, uh, but he did not... Uh, 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 focus on the, the uh, creation of material values on the, uh, uh, that, uh, done by the workers. Uh, he was most critical of the unproductive landlord who's, uh, who had a claim to rent uh, based on sheer traditional private ownership of land. He recognized the injustice done by the landlord to the capitalist but not the injustice done by both capitalist and landlord to the worker. Marxist political economy is the most comprehensive and profound study of the laws of motion of capitalism. Karl Marx laid the foundation of Marxist political economy in Das Kapital. Volume 1 was published in 1867, encompassing 
the genesis, development and decline of capitalism and pointed to the possibility of socialism. To grasp and analyze the internal laws of motion of capitalism, he concentrated on the production system rather than on the distributive system or the market and proceeded from the analysis of the commodity as the cell, the basic organic unit of the capitalist mode of production, uh, rather than that of the market phenomena which bourgeois political economy uh, overstresses. Uh, Marx uh, exposed the fundamental laws of motion that impelled free competition to develop toward the concentration of capital and create the very forces that are bound to bring about socialism. After Marx, uh, Lenin focused on monopoly capitalism and his imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Stalin and Mao would make further contributions to Marxist uh, political economy in connection with socialist revolution and construction. Marxist political economy encompasses Marx's uh, theoretical writings to the building of socialism. Um, political economy tackles Marx's critic of capitalism. He starts with the analysis of commodity. So can you please discuss commodity or what is its unique characteristics within the capitalism? Like Marx and Ricardo, uh, excuse me, like Adam Smith and Ricardo, Marx affirmed that the value of the commodity is the amount of labor time expended on its production. Labor time remains to this day a measure of labor uh, power uh, used in production. To focus on the commodity as the starting point of analysis is to affirm the primacy of production over distribution in the study of a certain mode of production. Commodity mass production is what differentiates capitalism from all previous economic systems, which had been basically natural economies, highly dependent on nature or land. A commodity is a thing produced by labor power and has use value and exchange value. Use value means that the thing can satisfy a human want. Exchange value means the thing can be exchanged in the market for another thing that normally involves the same amount of labor power. If one unit of a certain commodity takes one day of work to make, it will exchange for two units of another commodity, each of which takes a half day to make. In the commodity mass production and the capitalist system, no worker can lay claim to having produced an entire product. To measure the amount of labor power that goes into the making of a commodity, we have to go into averaging uh, the various standards of labor time or rates of productivity that go into the making of the commodity in a given society. The outcome of the computation is the socially necessary average labor time that goes into that commodity. Tito, uh, labor power is also a commodity under capitalism, no? And how does capitalism benefit from it on commodifying capital, um, labor power? Uh, you are correct in saying that labor power itself is a commodity in the capitalist system. Its value is the amount of socially necessary average labor time to produce the basic necessaries or wage goods to maintain and reproduce the worker and his family. In the labor market, the capitalist buyer of labor power offers the price of labor power, which is called the wage the value of labor power in money terms. The capitalist class gives the working class a subsistence wage. This should cover at the least the barest physical needs of the workers to keep them coming back to work and also to maintain a class as the source of labor. The workers themselves demand a minimum wage level in order to subsist. When business is good, wage increases may even be made so as to raise the level of productive skills among the workers. It is to the interest of the capitalist class to allow the subsistence, maintenance, and reproduction of the working class. Labor power is the sole commodity that is capable of reproducing itself and all other commodities. 
Capital by itself cannot produce anything. It is called dead labor. Historically, it is but an accumulation of labor power. It is congealed labor power. In the production of new commodities, no new value is created by the machines and raw materials. Their old values are merely transferred into the new commodities. New added values can only come from the labor power of the workers attending to the machines and raw materials. The capitalist class extracts its profits from the process of production itself and from the total value of commodities produced by the workers. The difference between the total value that the workers create and the wages that they receive is what is called surplus value or unpaid labor. This is the source of industrial and commercial profit, interest payments for the banks and land, land rent. In the theory of surplus, surplus value, radically differentiates Marxist political economy from bourgeois political economy. Can you please elaborate the theory of surplus value? Indeed, the theory of surplus value radically differentiates Marxist political economy from bourgeois political economy. It shows that profits are extracted from the process of production, particularly from surplus value. It likewise shows that exploitation of the working class is rooted in the process of production and not in the market. The leading classical economists Smith and Ricardo had affirmed the labor theory of value, but they did not develop it to the extent that Marx did. The general run of bourgeois economists descending from the classical economists have obscured the labor theory of value or completely negated it by asserting the primacy of the market mechanism over the productive process and by claiming that the profits are made in the market in the difference of buying and selling price and vice versa. But no new material values are created in the market. Total values in production are equal to total prices in the market. For the capitalists to extract a larger amount of surplus value, they lengthen the working day and depress the wages. Uh, this is called absolute surplus value. During the period of the primitive accumulation of capital, which went on for centuries and extended into the first half of the 19th century, the workday ranged from 12 hours to 18 hours at extremely low wages. The capitalists can also shorten the workday and raise wages, but they resort to such methods of raising productivity as the speed up, especially as a result of the introduction of the conveyor belt. Extremely high production quota subject to wage cuts due to non-fulfillment. Systems of rewards and punishment that motivate the worker <clears throat> uh, to put more work in less time and the like. In this case, relative surplus value is what is extracted. As a result of the increasing use of machines and worker resistance to the long work day, this was reduced to 12 hours in the greater part of the 19th century until it was further reduced to 10 hours in the late part of the 19th century. The eight-hour workday is largely a 20th century achievement of the international proletariat. In any case, the larger is the surplus value, the higher is the rate of labor exploitation. The rate of surplus value, also called the rate of exploitation, is arrived at by dividing the amount of surplus value by the amount of wages paid. Though the capitalist class needs the workers as the source of new values in production from which profits can be obtained, there is always a considerable portion of the working class that is unemployed, either due to a lag in the absorption of displaced peasants by industry in a developing economy or due to the disequilibrium in the fully developed economy. These unemployed are called the reserve army of labor. The more they are, the more they tend to press down the level of wages and um, uh, increase the surplus value obtainable from those employed. And it is a case of the capitalist class uh, 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 taking advantage of the uh, 
employed and the unemployed and using uh, the threat of unemployment uh, to press down wages even uh, 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 among the uh, employed workers. Tito, Marx laid, uh, Marx laid bare the laws of motion uh, of capitalism. According, uh, why does, according to him, capitalism is doomed to fail? Have we, see, uh, have we seen such failures in the capitalist countries? At the outset, I must make clear that capitalism and laying bare the laws of motion of capitalism explain the accumulation of capital and competition of the capitalist lead to concentration of constant capital at the expense of variable capital for wages. And uh, 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 this leads to the crisis of overproduction during which the workers are thrown out of their jobs, are aggrieved, and are likely to rise up. But at the same time, the winning capitalists can rise to a new level of capital concentration by absorbing and laying aside the losing capitalists. Uh, Marx never said that the crisis of overproduction would necessarily lead to collapse of capitalism in the era of free competition, capitalism. Even as he declared in the Communist Manifesto that such a crisis opened the possibility for workers to rise up and seize political power from the bourgeoisie. He did not even anticipate that the Paris Commune of 1871 would occur, but when it occurred, he supported and welcomed it as uh, the uh, prototype of proletarian revolution and proletarian class dictatorship. The Paris Commune of 1871 was still beyond the time of Das Kapital. Let me present the explanation of Marx for capital accumulation and the crisis of overproduction. The capitalists compete with each other to raise their productivity and achieve economies of scale in order to extract more surplus value from the total value created by workers and thereby accumulate capital. They are driven to produce more goods in less time at less and at less cost. Those who fail to adopt more efficient methods of production are priced out to the market. The capitalists are therefore driven to increase their constant capital for the means of production and decrease the variable capital for wages. At an early stage, the competition among the capitalists is essentially one of raising capital. The winners can raise more capital than the losers. This capital is divisible into two parts. One is constant capital, uh, which consists of the means of production, um, uh, which includes capital equipment, raw materials, plant site, and the like. And two, variable capital, which is the fund for wages. But as the competition rages and goes from one round to another, there is the ever-increasing trend to raise the organic composition of capital, that is to say, constant capital, in a simple language, uh, the capital is driven to increase his uh, um, uh, constant capital, uh, the, uh, which uh, is the term for the equipment, raw materials, plant site, and so on. After all, the winners and the competition swallow up the losers through mergers and other forms of absorption. There is always a need for the competing capitalists to build up constant capital in order to consolidate their position and to raise productivity further. Constant capital is raised at the expense of variable capital. The labor-saving machines displace the workers. In the heat of competition, the capitalists also think that they can improve their competitive position and raise their profits by reducing the variable capital. At first, this means that they depress the wages. Eventually, they reduce their workforce by acquiring labor-saving machines, in effect, increasing constant capital. The competing entrepreneurs or firms act um, anarchically in pursuit of their respective profit-seeking interests. They are out to trounce each other. Each fails to understand that by reducing variable capital and laying off workers, each is actually reducing the source of new values and, in effect, profits. The result is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. The profit rate is determined by dividing the surplus value by total capital, 
constant capital plus variable capital. Uh, that's what it meant by total capital. If constant capital in increase is, um, if constant capital is increased but variable capital is diminished, the amount of surplus value is reduced and the profit rate is likewise reduced. The high productivity of capital goods and that of capitalist competition reinforce each other to produce goods at low prices in comparison to those produced in backward modes of production. Commodities are sold at production prices equivalent to cost of production plus a small and dwindling average profit. The average profit is small and dwindling due to the diminution of variable capital in the process of production. In the race to raise the organic composition of capital, the competing capitalists build up department one, or that means capital goods, but then greater production under this department leads to still greater production under department two, that means the production of consumer goods. This comes into contradiction with the diminution of variable capital or wage fund. The increasing supply of the articles of, com of consumption does not jibe with increasing unemployment and diminishing purchasing power of the workers. The market consisting mainly of workers is narrowed by layoffs and uh, depressed wages resulting from the competitive drive to concentrate capital, thus arises the crisis of overproduction uh, relative to the market. Uh, at this point, I will uh, uh, I will say in uh, very simple terms, uh, the uh, accumulation of constant capital uh, leads to the shrinking of the market, despite the uh, because uh, uh, the buyers. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, the, the uh, abundant products cannot be bought anymore by the unemployed workers and uh, uh, those uh, uh, and, and uh, the wages of those employed uh, uh, fall behind. No, uh, in the crisis of overproduction, both overinvestment and underconsumption are operative. It is obvious that existing capital goods are capable of producing more than what the market can carry. At the same time, the workers do not have the income to purchase and consume all that is in the market. Neither can the puny number of capitalists consume what has been produced, even if they are the ones who have high incomes. The occurrence of the crisis of overproduction exposes the fatal weakness of capitalism. The, the economy operates far under capacity. Tremendous amounts of human and material resources go to waste. Commodities are even destroyed in order to adjust to the supply to the constricted market. The reserve army of labor becomes so large that it no longer simply presses down the wages, but cuts down effective demand. Both employed and unemployed are restless and tend to unite against the capitalist class. The crisis of production becomes an occasion for the big capitalist firms to swallow and uh, mass the smaller firms that go bankrupt. The drive towards even greater concentration of capital continues unabated. The economy becomes revived after so much waste and after the winning capitalists have grown so much bigger than before and start to rehire the unemployed. A period of boom follows uh, only to end up in another bust, which is worse than the previous one. This again leads to a higher concentration of capital in the firms fewer than before. The crisis of overproduction necessitates the use of the state in shoring up the capitalist system and appeasing or subduing the proletariat. At worst for the system, the crisis exacerbates the class struggle and is liable to lead to a revolutionary civil war and the victory of the proletariat. There is also the likelihood that the crisis leads to an international war. However, uh, Marx was not yet able to elaborate on this 
possibility, but he indeed showed uh, the tendency of capitalism uh, to move towards its doom through a series of worsening a crisis of overproduction. Tito capitalism has already reached its highest stage, which is modern imperialism. Could you please discuss how briefly imperialism was reached and which countries became imperialist and, um, of course, how? As Marx scientifically predicted, free competition in his time in mid-19th century or thereabouts would lead to the high concentration of capital in the hands of a few capitalist firms during the last three decades of the 19th century. Capitalists of Europe, the United States, and Japan made an outcry for the expansion of the market in view of their limited home markets. The British capitalist magnate Cecil Rhodes, the American politician Theodore Roosevelt, and men of letters like Roger Kipling and even Victor Hugo were among the most raucous or strident in calling for imperialist expansion and placing every part of the world in the capitalist network. They frankly admitted the capitalist motives even as they couched these in the rhetoric of civilizing the world. They echoed the cliches of old type mercantilist colonialism and applauded the bloody adventures of modern imperialism. Great Britain, the leading capitalist country, did not only have um, uh, its old colonies like India, uh, what are now Pakistan and Bangladesh, Ceylon or Sri Lanka, what is now uh, Malaysia, Australia, Egypt, parts of Latin America and so on, but also acquired the largest share in the late 19th century rush to colonize uh, Africa. It consolidated the largest spheres of influence in China Next only to Great Britain as the largest imperialist power was France. It had its old colonies, which included Indochina, and acquired the largest share in Africa next to Great Britain. Small capitalist countries like the Netherlands and Belgium also had substantial colonial holdings. The former had Indonesia as the largest possession and the latter the Belgian Congo. Strong late commerce to capitalist development like the United States, Germany, and Japan, participated in the rush to acquire colonies. Notwithstanding its large frontier in the West, its acquisitions from colonial powers, Spain and France in North America, and its hegemony over the main part of South America. The United States provoked Spain into a war in order to seize Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines, and sidled up to Great Britain in order to have a share of the imperialist action in China. Germany got some portions of Africa, spheres of influence in China, some Pacific islands, coveted large portions of Eastern Europe, and got into complex entanglements with Russia and Austria. The Alsace-Lorraine areas taken from France by Germany as a result of the War of 1871, continued to be a bone of contention between the two countries. Japan held Formosa, or Taiwan, and Korea as colonial possessions and a sphere of influence in North China. Russia, the weakest of the capitalist countries, held on to large territories seized from China and was at odds. <coughs> with the old Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was no longer a part, any part of the world that was not in the international network of capitalism. Uh, that was the first wave of what you might call globalization by uh, capitalism. Yeah. Uh, the capitalist countries had drawn in the rest of the world as they competed for markets of surplus commodities, sources of raw materials, fields of investment, spheres of influence, and positions of strength. The monopoly capitalists were out to uh, relieve capitalist society of its uh, capital glut, relative overproduction, 
and class contradictions by being able to exploit the people in colonies and semi-colonies. Uh, Lenin, Lenin studied and wrote extensively about imperialism. What were the basic features of imperialism, according to him? In his imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, Lenin stated the five basic features of imperialism or monopoly capitalism. They are as follows. One, the concentration of capital has reached the point that monopolies have become dominant in capitalist society. In two, industrial capital has merged with bank capital to become finance capital and create a finance oligarchy. Three, the export of surplus value, aside from that of surplus commodities, has gained importance of its own and is the outlet for the capital glut in capitalist countries. Four, international combines of monopolies, trust, cartels, syndicates, and the like have emerged. Five, the division of the world among the capitalist powers has been completed and its redivision cannot but lead to war. Tito, what is the effects of having these monopolies in the economy? Monopoly means that one company or a single combination of companies controlled by a single group of capitalists dominates the main part or entirety of an industry. At the start of the 20th century, such strategic and major industries as uh, steel, oil, coal, machine building, chemicals, railroads, etc. were already in the hands of monopoly capitalists. As early as 1890, public clamor in the United States rose against such monopoly uh, capitalists as the Rockefellers in oil, uh, DuPonts in chemicals, Mellons in steel, Vanderbilts uh, from the built Netherlands in railroad, and others came um, to such a high pitch that the Sherman antitrust law was enacted. But at most, the monopoly capitalists could only be summoned to administrative hearings where they were advised to merely rearrange their investments. Eventually, the law was directed more against trade unions as supposed monopolies in restraint of trade. The era of free competition basically came to an end towards the end of the 19th century. All major fields of economic activity was dominated by the large monopoly firms and this continued to grow larger. In the era of imperialism, the monopoly firms have become even larger by extracting super profits from the colonies and semi-colonies and by continuing to engage in mergers as a result of recurrent economic crisis. One learns much about monopoly by perusing the assets, sale and profits of such uh, companies as the Standard Oil chain of companies, uh, General Motors, Ford Motors, uh, General Electric, U.S. Steel, Bethlehem Steel, and the like. One learns that all the talk, uh, all the talk about free enterprise by bourgeois economists is all a lie. In this digital age, uh, the monopoly capitalists have uh, uh, have even become bigger. Uh, as of now, it is estimated that only a handful of billionaires. Uh, control or own own 80% of the uh, wealth of the world. But uh, let us stick to uh, um, the text of the basic principles of uh, um, Marxism-Leninism, which I wrote. In the late 1950s, uh, the 135 largest manufacturing corporations in the United States accounted for half the manufacturing output in the United States, and that the 250 largest firms turned out a flow of goods equal in value to the output of the entire economy prior to World War II. Nowadays, under the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization and the application of higher technology in production, 
distribu uh, and distribution, the concentration of monopoly capital is far, far higher than ever before. Tito, what does it mean to have industrial and bank capital merged together? The merger of industrial and bank capital has put more capital at the disposal of the monopoly capitalists than ever before and has spawned a financed oligarchy that amasses profits, not because of its entrepreneurial skills, because, but because it simply controls and manipulates um, finance capital. Uh, the monopoly capitalist uh, uh, class hires the managers to run its productive enterprises and as a rentier class simply sits back to uh, await the dividends from uh, shareholdings. I must explain that, uh, you know, in traditional times, in pre-imperialist times, banks were used, you know, to handle uh, uh, letters of credit in trading. They were in the main commercial banks. But, but when there was a merger of industrial and um, uh, bank capital, the industrial capitalists were uh, in uh, uh, were in a uh, um, uh, stronger position uh, to um, uh, engage in enterprises and at the same time uh, manipulate the finance uh, in order to uh, increase their assets. So uh, the parasitic character of the big bourgeoisie became even more uh, extended with the use of uh, uh, bank capital. The bank capital um, uh, fell into the hands of the industrial capitalist and uh, uh, the combination of industrial and uh, uh, bank capital served to uh, uh, strengthen monopoly capitalism. Monopoly capitalists who own banks, Rockefellers in Chase Manhattan and National City Bank of New York, Ford's in Manufacturers Hanover Bank, Mellon's in Mellon Bank, DuPont's in Chemical Bank, etc., actually lend the money of other people, including deposits of workers, to their own industrial firms at prime rates for their expansion. And they borrow from their own banks in order to buy stocks. In times prior to imperialism, the banks were autonomous from manufacturers, and they at first specialized in extending commercial credit or handling bills of exchange. Subsequently, they extended loans for industrial projects, but still retained their autonomy. Finally, in the imperialist era, the monopoly capitalists put the banks and industries under their ownership and control. The role of monopoly capitalists as rentiers is underscored by the use of holding companies, trust funds, and tax-exempt government bonds. They are further removed from the process of production and their parasitic character is starkly obvious. It is their hired financial managers who manage their mounting funds. The monopoly capitalists have no claim to income except by the backward principles of private property and heredity. According to the Lampman 1922 to 1956 study, the share of top wealth uh, holders in national wealth in 1922 to 1956, 1 1.6 of the adult population in the United States uh, owned 32% of all privately owned wealth. Among the several items in the list of their wealth are 82.2% of all stocks and 100% of state and local tax-exempt bonds. The disparity in the wealth of the monopoly capitalists is now far worse than ever before. Tito, what are the roles of monopolies, multinational giant, the bank, and the trust in exploiting the workers, migrants, and even the environment? The monopolies, multinational giants, banks, and trusts combine in exploiting the workers in their own countries and in whichever countries there are, there are uh, migrant workers. Uh, they have aggravated the conditions of underdevelopment uh, and uh, unemployment and mass poverty in the overwhelming majority of uh, countries. 
lowering the wages of workers and forcing the workers to seek uh, low-paid menial jobs abroad, suffer separation from family and friends, and face uncertain conditions, often without guarantees of rights. Monopoly capitalism is responsible for the plunder of the environment and bringing humankind to the brink of environmental catastrophe. We're already experiencing global warming as a result of the carbon dioxide emissions destroying the ozone layer, fires in vast tracts of uh, forest land, melting of the icebergs, the rise of the ocean levels, floods, drought, and landslides, and the emergence of pandemics due to the disturbance of microorganisms in the forest. Tito, why do imperialist powers need colonies and semi-colonies? The imperialist powers need to export surplus capital in the form of loans and direct investments in the colonies and semi-colonies. The export of surplus capital and surplus commodities serves to relieve the capitalist economy not only of its capital glut, but also of its surplus commodities. Loans facilitate the sale of surplus commodities, paves the way for direct investments and earn interest, and becomes converted into equity upon failure of the debtor uh, to pay the debt. Direct investments are forthright and even more effective than loans in gaining control over another economy. They establish ownership and earn profits. They facilitate the sale of surplus commodities and the acquisition of raw materials for the industries in the metropolis. Though the initial impulse in the export of capital is to seek relief from capital glut, it results in the aggravation of the original problem because it brings home to the metropolis a much larger amount of capital fattened by profits and interest. The monopoly capitalists at home must still look for new outlets for their capital. Tito, the imperialist powers prevent colonies and their semi-colonies to, fi- to, fully, to fully develop their own economy. Um, why is the reason behind this? The export of uh, capital is uh, to colonies, semi-colonies, and dependent countries arose under modern imperialism. In the old type mercantilist colonialism, like uh, Spanish colonialism in the Philippines, when the primitive accumulation of capital was the process involved, the colonial power uh, embarked at worst on blatant undisguised plunder, or at best a grossly unequal trade. For a change, modern imperialism is compelled by capital glut to go through the motion of making loans and direct investments. Some amount of development above the level achieved by old type colonialism occurs, but this remains superficial, lopsided, and sporadic inasmuch as it is restricted by the dumping of surplus commodities on the dependent country. The flow of investments in, is made in such a manner that the dependent economy remains basically a reliable supplier of raw materials and an importer of manufactured goods from the metropolis. Thus, foreign direct investments go mainly into extractive industries and export agriculture. Loans are extended to favor this type of productive activity and to divert the client state from promoting a well-balanced developing economy into merely improving the infrastructures the roads, bridges, ports, and the like, for the purpose of reinforcing the unequal exchange of raw materials from the dependent country and manufacturers from the metropolis. It is definitely not in the interest of an industrial capitalist country to allow a subservient, uh, underdeveloped economy to develop into another industrial capitalist country and another competitor. Tito, one of the leading imperialist powers is, of course, the United States. No, how how did the United States manage to stay as a major superpower for so long? The U.S. was the imperialist power that benefited most from World War II and its aftermath. 
It profited from war production during World War, during the World War, and thus overcame uh, the problems from the Great Depression of the 1930s. It was unquestionably the strongest imperialist power in economic and military terms from 1945 to 1975. It launched the Cold War and the wars of aggression in Korea, China, and elsewhere in order to keep the military-industrial complex uh, strong. The crisis of overproduction began to bother the U.S. only when Germany and other West Ger European countries and Japan rebuilt their war-damaged economies and competed with U.S. surplus capital and surplus goods. While the U.S. <clears throat> While the U.S. was overspending on overseas military bases and wars of aggression, the U.S. was afflicted by the problem of stagflation by the mid-1970s and shifted towards the policy of neoliberalism by 1979. The policy would be pushed by the U.S. in the next four decades. In the aftermath of World War II, several socialist countries arose in addition to the Soviet Union. So the newly independent countries and the national liberation movements continue to surge. But the U.S. used the Cold War to carry out the anti-communist crusade and push a neo-colonial policy. Worst of all, for the proletarian and people of the world, Modern revisionism arose in the Soviet Union in order to undermine socialism, restore capitalism, bring about social imperialism, and ultimately the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. The Dengis counter-revolution in China also won against Mao's um, uh, line of socialist revolution and construction and the great proletarian cultural revolution against imperialism, revisionism, and reaction. So, the U.S. in 1991 became the sole superpower, still the strongest imperialist power in economic and military terms. But the crisis of overproduction within the U.S. and the world capitalist system continued. The U.S. aggravated this crisis by financializing its economy, outsourcing consumer manufacturing to China, and engaging in endless wars of aggression in Afghanistan, the former Yugoslavia, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and other countries. Under the cover of being sole superpower and being still number one imperialist power, the U.S. went on accelerated strategic decline due to the aggravated crisis of overproduction within the U.S. and globally. While the U.S. is on accelerated strategic decline, China, which has been its number one partner in neoliberal globalization, has gained economic and military strength. The U.S. has become so wary of China to the point of accusing it of unfair economic and trade policies and uh, practices and stealing technology. Since 2017, the U.S. has definitively regarded China as its chief economic competitor and political rival. The inter-imperialist contradictions of the U.S. and China are sharpening fast and are on top of all the worsening inter-imperialist contradictions due to the crisis of the, of the world capitalist system, due particularly to the financial crisis of 2008 and the ensuing economic stagnation. Tito, they say that capitalism is on a spiraling condition. Can you explain this concept? I do not know what uh, um, uh, the concept of uh, spiraling capitalism or capitalism uh, is in a spiraling condition is. Uh, um, but uh, let me uh, let me take up the the element of uh, spiraling. Uh, if I may use the term spiraling in connection with the general crisis of monopoly capitalism. I would say that there are indeed many things spiraling all at the same time and spiraling out of control by the imperialist powers and by the IMF, World Bank and WTO. The capital accumulation 
in the hands of a few monopoly capitalists is spiraling upwards while the conditions of unemployment, depressed income and mass poverty among the workers and other working people, including the dwindling middle class, are spiraling downwards like a bottomless vortex. Just consider that a few billionaires own more than more wealth than 80% of the entire world population. Whenever the crisis of overproduction takes a new plunge, the states and their central banks come to the rescue of the monopoly capitalists with bailout loans and stimulus packages and the public debt spirals as never before. The global public debt of more than uh, $257 trillion, which is now unsustainable, unsustainably more than three times the global GDP of uh, 70 trillion US dollars as of the four, first quarter of this year is the biggest bubble that is expected to burst soon and to cause uh, so far the biggest and most lethal crisis of the world capitalist system. Tito, the decline of capitalism, such as the economic crisis, will also affect um, the people, not just the capitalists. How do you think we can combat this? Of course, the decline of capitalism and economic crisis inflict intolerable suffering on the people. The people have no choice but to wage a democratic struggle for better working and living conditions, for policies to overcome the escalating um, uh, uh, dismal, the, the escalating conditions of exploitation and oppression, and for revolutionary change in the direction of socialism, whatever are the immediate conditions and issues that must be dealt with immediately in an imperialist or non-imperialist country. Definitely in the Philippines, the Filipino people must wage and win the people's democratic revolution with a socialist perspective before they can begin the socialist revolution. Even in the well-developed capitalist countries, they need to wage a democratic struggle against the forces of imperialism and fascism before they can get hold of the advanced means of production for the socialist transformation of the economy and society. How do you think, Tito, uh, is a probability of a war between two imperialist superpowers such as US and China? A direct inter-imperialist war between the U.S. and China using nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction is not yet imminent or nearly probable. It is only remotely probable in highly uh, hypothetical terms. Each side has the capability to inflict extreme destruction on the other side and uh, on the entire planet. And no side can dispatch the missile. The, the missiles with nuclear warheads without the other side having the time to retaliate. As in the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were mutually deterred by a balance of terror and by the certainty of mutually assured destruction. The U.S. and China cannot go into a nuclear war with each other without involving their respective allies. The U.S. cannot deliver a surprise nuclear attack uh, to China without Russia reacting against the U.S. And China cannot deliver the same kind of surprise attack uh, uh, on the U.S. without the NATO allies of the U.S. reacting. It will take a crazy fascist leader in an imperialist country to start a nuclear war. Perhaps the current irrationality of imperialist powers in engaging in a nuclear arms race is a preparation for the imperialist and fascist destruction of mankind. But in the meantime, China is still in the business of pleading to the U.S. for the continuance of their cooperative relations, while the U.S. poses more and more as the offended and threatened imperialist power. They are still negotiating and haggling over bilateral matters. They still have plenty of allowance to please each other or to harm each other, without the necessity of a direct war. They still have plenty of allowance, too, for shifting the burden of capitalist crisis, as well as proxy wars, to the underdeveloped countries and regions of the world before they get into a direct uh, inter-imperialist war. 
Tito, in today, you know, what is the condition of the world capitalist system? Is it possible to establish a time frame in which the capitalism will collapse? The U.S. as number one imperialist power is seriously worried by its accelerated strategic decline and by China having taken advantage of their relations in the last four decades and having become its number one economic competitor and number one political rival for world hegemony. Their contradictions are now at the top of all the inter-imperialist contradictions arising from the current crisis of the world capitalist system. The crisis of the world capitalist system that burst out in 2008 has rolled out as the so-called Great Recession, more than a decade of, uh, of global economic stagnation and massive destruction of productive forces, and is taking a new plunge since 2018, and is now considered as comparable or even worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s. The new level of crisis is called by some analysts as uh, the great uh, lockdown to implicate the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But the crisis was already worsening rapidly even before the pandemic. This has, of course, become a serious aggravating factor and has exposed the extreme antisocial character of neoliberalism and the inadequacy or lack of a free a uh, public health system, food assistance, and unemployment relief during the lockdowns. A timetable cannot be set for the collapse of capitalism. We can only be certain that the much worse and unprecedented crisis provides the conditions for the rise of contradictory forces, such as fascist and other ultra-reactionary forces on one side, and the anti-imperialist democratic and socialist forces on the other side. The people are increasingly desirous of revolutionary change, and since last year, the anti-imperialist, democratic, and socialist forces have been resurgent through protest mass actions. But there is there are still a lot of revolutionary mass struggles and advances needed to overcome the setbacks due to modern revisionism capitalist restoration and counter-revolution since more than four decades ago, even as we are confident that we are now in transition to the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution, in breeding fascism and other forms of extreme reaction, the crisis of the world capitalist system will only drive the proletariat and people of the world to fight for national liberation a democracy and socialism on a global scale. So we are still in a, um, um, a hot contest. Um, uh, we are now wit witnessing an increasingly hotter contest between uh, the, uh, the forces of imperialism and uh, uh, ultra-reaction on one hand and the forces of uh, uh, national liberation, democracy, uh, and socialism on the revolutionary side. Thank you so much, Tito, for answering our questions. And I think that ends our uh, questions, our prepared questions. So we are now opening the floor for our audience. If you have questions in mind during the discussion, it is now your chance to drop it on the comment box for Tito Jo to answer it. So meanwhile, while we are waiting for uh, questions from our audience, uh, let's uh, go into a quick break. And we'll be right back after a short while. Even in some dangers, we still investigate the cases of uh, human rights violations because we believe that the persons in authority won't do it. We know that it's part of the state you know, to harass and to sow fear so that we will be silent and stop our work. There's no such thing as uh, state-sanctioned killings. 
Itong araw din po ay pinapalikan nila ang silver anniversary, silver founding anniversary ng kanilang organisasyon. Pinatawagan natin para magbigay ng kanilang mensahe si Tinay Palabay mula sa karapatan. Pasismo! Biguin! Bago po ako magsimula, inaanyayaan ko po ang lahat na baba po saglit. O kaya pwede namang hawakan ng uh, kayakap ang mga placards at ibigay po ang pinakamalakas na pagpupugay at pagpalakpak sa isang butihing ina, sa isang human rights defender, isa pong health worker. Pagkasamahan natin si Sara Alvarez. Pasensya na ho kayo. Kami ho mga kasama ni Sara. Hindi pa po makapaniwala ko ngayon. Pinatay po nila si Sara. Si Sara po! Ang pagpas lang sa kanya, di na kami magpapaligoy-ligoy pa. Lintek, magpapaligoy-ligoy pa ba tayo? Sino nagpakulong kay Sara Alvarez ng mahigit dalawang, halos dalawang taon? Di ba mga armed forces of the Philippines yun? Sila ho ang nagkaso sa kanya. Inilayo siya sa kanyang anak dalawang taon. Sino ang naglagay sa kanya doon sa hit list sa proscription case? Iba pa ang Department of Justice? Sino ang naglagay sa mukha niya at sa mukha ni Attorney Ben Ramos doon sa poster na ipinalaganap sa Negros? Iba ang Philippine National Police? Sino ang nagdetect sa amin sa kanya? Ako, mapagpatol eh. Pinatawagan ko yung mga hayop na yan. Nagpapakilala naman silang militar eh. Di sila nagtatago. Sino ang walang humpay na naninira kay Sara at sa iba pang mga tagapagtaguyod ng karapatang pantao? Di ba si Pangulong Duterte? Mahigit sampung beses Sampung beses, special mention kami. Ngayigit 20 beses, documenters kami. Natural. Tilalagay namin, tinatala namin, kung ilang beses niya kami minura. Kaya hindi na po ako magpapadaskul-daskul pa ang pumatay kay Sara Alvarez ay mga death squad ng gobyernong ito. Inaakusahan namin kayo mga hayop, mga tarantado at gago, mga pasista ng teroristang gobyernong ito. Katulad po ng kung paano kami umiyak at nagalit sa ginawa nila kay Karandi. Ang galit po na ito, hindi lang nandito sa dibdib namin. Ang galit na ito, nagamit namin to para maghanap ng mustisya kahit saan si Sara Alvarez hindi yan pa si HR, si HR lang napakalami ng paraan para makahanap ng mustisya napakamura daw ng mustisya dito sa ating bayan pero kailangan nating gawin eh. kailangan nating gawin dahil kapag hindi napapadagot ang mga taong ito lalo silang papatay ng mga mamamayan na nais baguhin ang hindi makataong sitwasyon ng ating mga kababayan dito. Nananawagan po kami sa mamamayan ng buong daigdig para sa iba't ibang paraan ng pagpapanagot. Bahala ho kayo kahit anong paraan yan, kahit sa ang korte yan, armado man yan o hindi. Ang hustisya ho, 
ay tukol sa pagpapanagot. Ito ho ay inakamit ng mamamayan para hindi na maulit ang mga bagay na nagpapasakit, nagpap, nagbibigay ng pagdurusa sa mamamayan. Kaya po ating bigyang pugay, tayo po ay buong sikay at buong tapang na kumiros. Ito po ang taging paraan para ating mabigyan ng hustisya ang mamamayan. Isa sa paraan sa pagbibigay ng hustisya sa ating mga kasamahan ay ang pagpapatansik sa hayop na nandun sa Malacanang. Walang padaskul-daskul din po naming sasabihin na ang hustisya, ang isang unang hakbang ng hustisya ay ang pagpapatalsik kay Pangulong Duterte mula sa kanyang pwesto. Mabuhay ang mga human rights defenders katulad ni Sara Alvarez, katulad po ni Caranda Lechanis, ay Louis Tagapia at sa kanyang, mga pamil sa kanyang pamilya. Guys, kasama ninyo po kami sa paghahanap ng hustisya. Isigaw po natin ang isinisigaw ni Lazara at ni Lacarandal. Makiba ka! Huwag magtakot! Hello everyone, mga kasama. Welcome back again to the National Democratic Line Online School, the basic principles of Marxism, Leninism, on political economy. So, um, a while ago, we have discussed um, the the topic and right now we are now opening the floor for our audience uh, to their question to be answered by Tito Jo. So a few questions have already been sent, of course, um, but before that, um, greetings to all our viewers. I hope you are enjoying our discussion right now. Uh, Tito Jo, the first question would be, is the description of capitalism in volume one of Capital only appropriate for the era of free enterprise non-monopoly capitalism or has this theory been superseded by Lenin's theory of imperialism? If not, how can the two theories be brought together? Uh, Lenin developed uh, what uh, uh, Marx had written. Marx uh, uh, saw the tendency of free competition, uh, capitalism uh, towards uh, monopoly uh, precisely because of the uh, competition among the uh, uh, capitalist firms then um, and because of they are all driven to raise their constant capital against uh, variable capital and then uh, this would result in the falling uh, the tendency of uh, the profit rate to fall and so on and so forth, crisis of overproduction would arise and then um, there would be winners and losers among the capitalists and um, uh, the winners would absorb uh, the losers and so there would be, the, there was a tendency already to build uh, uh, monopolies. So, um, uh, in the latter part of, uh, of the 19th century, uh, the growth of uh, monopoly capitalism was already uh, perceivable, but of course, at the time when uh, Volume One was written, um, uh, only the trend uh, was visible. The the tendency of uh, uh, big of uh, firms to become bigger. Um, but uh, in the time of Lenin, what uh, what uh, uh, came about uh, was already several. Uh, countries uh, dominated by, by, by monopoly capitalism. There were already uh, several competing uh, imperialist powers which left uh, no part of the world no, uh, uh, untouched by capitalism. Uh, every country had already been uh, integrated into the world capitalist system. Uh, that's how uh, the imperialist powers and the imperialist powers who are competing. The old time uh, imperialist powers uh, had their biggest share, and but the newcomer, the newcomers like the US, uh, Germany, and Japan eh, were um, over eager to have their uh, 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 shares and they would like to increase uh, uh, those shares. So uh, the balance would be upset, resulting 
in World War One and World War Two. So there is a fluidity. Um, there is a, um, a fluidity, a development from one level of development to a higher level development uh, with regard to capitalism. And in the theorizing by um, uh, Marx and Lenin, there is continuity. So what um, uh, uh, what Lenin did uh, was to develop further the Marxist theory, and he was able to describe uh, perfectly uh, the era of modern imperialism, which uh, which uh, emerged from the era of uh, free competition. Um. Tito, next question would be, um, what is your take on protectionism or claiming to withdraw from international structure deemed to be capitalist imperialist? If globalism or global exchange is an, um, uh, an imperialist or a capitalist idea? It is, in the, it is in the nature of imperialist powers to be protectionist, no? To be not only nationalist, but ultra-nationalist. But you know, they pretend uh, to be uh, to be for free trade. Eh? Free trade is some kind of a license. Even in old colonial times, the Great Britain, sure of its own economic strength, uh, would uh, uh, wave the flag of free trade. Uh, but be because in real terms it was superior. Now, but when there are already several imperialist powers with competing industrial economies then uh, uh, the tendency to become protectionist would indeed uh, uh, cause wars. Protectionism um, of the imperialist powers who were competing against each other led to World War I, and then it also led to the Second World War. So, um, the U.S. Uh, having emerged as number one imperialist power, in uh, economic and military terms, would wave the flag of free enterprise, free trade, and so on, confident that it is the strongest. No, but and then, but the U.S. knows how to know, knows how to um, uh, fix its uh, strategy and tactics. You know, uh, when uh, the economies after World War II, when the economies of Germany and um, and Japan were reconstructed and they were um, giving a strong competition um, to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the US. Uh, the US uh, uh, adopted what was called um, uh, the multilateral, uh, multilateralism no? um, in the combination of the imperialist powers. Uh, because after all, they have, they have had the UN and the multilateral agencies like IMF and World Bank and uh, um, in the future and there is in, in, in soon enough uh, the, the, the World Trade Organization. And so they have these uh, uh, mechanisms for multilateral cooperation among the imperialist powers. But they could cooperate only at the expense of the third world, no? Um, and um, so uh, um, it is uh, for quite some time, uh, the U.S. reacted to uh, the competition from other countries by adopting, uh, for instance, uh, at first they tried neo keynesian methods uh, in up to the 1970s um, to stimulate their economy. Then they adopted, at the end of the 70s, they adopted neoliberalism. And uh, that was supposed to um, that was supposed to uh, stress and develop multilateral cooperation without but without saying it at the expense of the third world. And then when uh, China and Russia became capitalist with uh, in, with industrial bases, um, the more uh, neoliberalism had to be uh, carried forward by the U.S. Then, when um, China especially was able to take advantage of the neoliberal partnership with the U.S., um, by 2017, the U.S. strategy planners um, uh, would uh, make conclusions that China had become already the number one competitor and um, 
uh, number one competitor and uh, number one political rival. And so by 2018, uh, Trump was already accusing China of unfair economic and uh, trade practices and stealing, uh, stealing technology from the U.S. So um, the two strongest economies are now at odds with each other uh, because of the intensity of the crisis of overproduction. And it is uh, Trump uh, who is now advocating practically uh, protectionism made in America and so on. Uh, uh, they have this made in America um, line and of course they uh, they talk against Trump. He talk, uh, Trump talks against uh, the uh, announcement also of China that it will make a, it will push a made in China policy uh, by 2025. And you know the U.S. is feels threatened that China will start uh, uh, will start putting sticking Chinese brands on things they had uh, learned from the the, the Chinese uh, from the U.S. and, and other foreign enterprises. Uh, uh, invested in China, no? So, in other words, uh, even if China pretends to be for neoliberalism now more than the uh, uh, earliest and strongest instigator of neoliberalism, the U.S., well, the two are going protectionist. And um, protectionism means, you know, looking after your own self-interest and at the expense of others. And uh, now, uh, and that uh, self-interest of the imperialist powers had always been there, but it was concealed by the fact that the imperialist powers uh, were able to uh, combine uh, at the expense of the entire uh, third world, uh, the underdeveloped countries, which are their source of cheap raw materials and cheap uh, agricultural products and also uh, markets and um, as uh, and also fields of investments so um, uh, the tendency of uh, the, the protectionism that is now arising you can hear it uh, directly from the mouths of the leaders of the imperialist powers uh, that goes to indicate that the crisis of overproduction has really be become very bad and all that pretense about free trade uh, is not true after all. Tito, next question would be, why do Western leftists insist that China is anything but imperialist? And why are there debates on socialist nature of Vietnam, Cuba, and etc.? What is the definite measure whether a country is socialist or not? Uh, you know, the so-called leftists of the West, uh, you know, um, I think um, uh, these are uh, organizations that became habituated, you know, to following the Big Brother. Uh, you know, or they are afflicted by this Philistine attitude of, uh, you know, uh, uh, being worth something if you have uh, uh, something big uh, to uh, uh, to boast of as uh, as your. Um, as your uh, partner or influencer and so on. So um, there is the tendency of a small lab groups eh, to look for a big brother, um, especially in the West where, you know, the lab movement uh, still has to develop uh, uh, the, the what you might call uh, loosely as the uh, uh, lab movement finds its sharpest and strongest expressions where people's wars are being carried out, like in the Philippines um, and in uh, uh, India and so on, where, you know, uh, large numbers of people are being led by communist parties. And um, uh, these are parties also which have already studied thoroughly the behavior of the former big brothers the Soviet Union that became revisionist and social imperialist and eventually collapsed and became entirely capitalist. And then these are parties also that observe China, where it seemed like Mao would be able to, um, uh, to make the Cultural Revolution succeed uh, in combating revisionism. 
But it turned out Dengish count, the, the, Kending, the Dengish counter-revolution um, did, uh, came about and defeated the line of Mao. And so China has become capitalist. So it's completely an illusion for some people to think um, that China is still socialist. Indeed, like the Soviet Union, when it was social imperialist, there are still enterprises, key enterprises. Uh, 3% of the corporations uh, owned by the state still control uh, 30% or even more. And uh, uh, so there is what uh, the U.S. would call the two-tiered uh, economy of China. The one, one, one uh, tier, one pillar uh, is, the, uh, um, is the state capitalism and uh, the other tier is private capitalism. And, and uh, the U.S. calls China a cheat for promising uh, to privatize the state-owned enterprises as a condition for joining the World Trade Organization. But China did not, no? It only it cheated by saying, oh, we have reduced the number of state-owned corporations to only 3%. But that uh, 3% controlled. But this is uh, state monopoly capitalism. Uh, Hitler also used state monopoly capitalism to revive the German economy um, uh, in civil enterprises as well as in, in military production. You see, uh, it's not social. Uh, socialists do not monopolize uh, in uh, in being able to use state mechanisms to build uh, the, or to to strengthen the economy. So, um, what is surprising to me is that the, after all this time of uh, China exposing itself as a capitalist, as an imperialist power, some small left groups still believe that China is socialist. No, they are, um, they are uh, what you call, uh, these so-called left small groups uh, uh, having that belief are little children looking for a big brother. And um, the point is uh, to make their, revolution, their revolutionary movement in their own countries and just uh, do not uh, think that uh, they can be inspired only if there is a big uh, um, uh, brother like the, the former China of Mao uh, that has already become a, a gigantic uh, capitalist country engaged in a inter-imperialist conflict with the U.S. Tito, next question would be... Uh... Our next question is, do you think the, the pandemic is the perfect opportunity for China to overtake the U.S. in terms of global control in the economy? Uh, indeed, uh, uh, U.S. is uh, getting hit hard by COVID-19. And, you know, there, there, there are accusations and counter accusations between the two countries. Uh, China first... Um, uh, was the first to accuse the U.S. that uh, uh, soldiers, American soldiers participating in the world military games in Wuhan uh, uh, brought the disease. Uh, some five soldiers, uh, at, uh, some five members of the athletic dele delegation of the U.S. Uh, fell sick uh, with COVID-19. And there was supposed to be before the, the athletic delegation went to the to China to Wuhan in particular, there was uh, uh, some foul ups in uh, Fort uh, Detrick. Um, Fort Detrick is a major military camp where bio lab about uh, bio warfare laboratories are maintained by the U.S. Um, then <laughs> the and there would later on be accusations from the uh, U.S. that uh, uh, China uh, deliberately made uh, uh, COVID-19 because there are supposed to be elements in COVID-19 that only humans, uh, experimenters can introduce. No, uh, some elements uh, that, uh, invo that involve uh, that are also involved in HIV and so on. And uh, anyway. Uh, what seems to be the biggest uh, uh, circumstantial evidence by use by the U.S., why is it that um, um, 
China now is practically free of COVID-19 and uh, 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 COVID-19 hit the Wuhan all right, but why is it that Shanghai and uh, Beijing were not hit? Um, yeah. uh, does it mean China has the antidote? <laughs> <laughs> and, and now it's the, the U.S. and the rest of the world suffering uh, from COVID-19 for lack of that antidote, no? So, uh, but uh, you see, indeed, uh, enough of COVID-19. Uh, the uh, it has it has it is an aggravating factor. It aggravates uh, what has been going on even before COVID, as the deterioration of the. Uh, uh, world capitalist economy and the particular and the economies of the particular uh, imperialist countries. You know that uh, uh, U.S. and Europe uh, have uh, public debt uh, um, reaching to the level, I think, of 380 uh, percent uh, or uh, 3.8 times, you know, uh, their GDP. And then China also has more than 300% of its public debt. Uh, uh, I mean to say its public debt being 300% of its uh, GDP. That's how bad uh, uh, the imbalances in these imperialist economies. And um, well, with regard to the relationship or, or the conflict between the U.S. and China, they are in a... Uh, uh, as they engage in, uh, in economic competition and political rivalry, they, dam they actually damage each other. Okay, I'll demonstrate to you. So China is supposed to be coming up as the, it's supposed to be the second uh, largest economy in the world. And uh, you can even say that it is the largest number one economy if you use uh, um, you don't just use uh, GDP, but uh, you use the what they call the purchasing power parity. Yeah? The yuan can buy more things, and uh, so therefore um, uh, China has a more uh, has a stronger currency and so on. Um, but the point is, China has been very dependent on. Um, export surpluses to the U.S. You know, the U.S. is the, is the biggest consumer market. Uh, with that being shut, uh, with that being shut down by, the, by Trump and uh, I suppose the succeeding leaders of the U.S., uh, China is in trouble. It has been using the, its uh, 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 foreign currency reserve, uh, res, uh, reserve especially the, the U.S., to back up its uh, generation of finance. Eh? And so with the loss, uh, with the cutdowns on uh, Chinese exports to, to the U.S., uh, China is in trouble. And then uh, it has made loans to uh, so many countries in Africa and Asia at onerous terms. But you know, if those economies are in trouble, their best defense against the foreign loan should be uh, to uh, to go uh, in default, no? And that gives mm -hmm. trouble to the lender. The lender is greedy, but the the, the victims uh, uh, declare defaults. And um, so the <clears throat> and the other imperialist power will say, "Oh, you don't be afraid about about defaulting on Chinese loans because we will provide you uh, the loans." That's how the fight is developing with regard to loans, you know. And uh, so, yeah. and then, uh, you know, the export surplus of China does not belong entirely to China. They, a lot of it belong to foreign, U.S. and other foreign companies uh, invested in China. But you see, uh, when, the, when, the, the, when money is paid by, let's say, by U.S. purchasers, uh, for the uh, uh, export from China, the Chinese Central Bank hold the U.S. currency. And then the uh, Chinese Central Bank, Bank can, and the Chinese political leadership can play with that amount in the Central Bank. But actually the money is not entirely, uh, not entirely China's. 
And now that there is a cut down of this export surplus, um, uh, China is in trouble. And then there is a practice in China of uh, loose lending eh, at the at various levels. And, and uh, also there is overproduction of certain things. So, so there were so many big uh, steel and small steel producers producing at the same time, producing such a big surplus that they cannot sell. And right now um, there is uh, uh, what you know, what you might call a sharp fall in steel production because the, the medium and small steel producers are told to stop producing eh? as because uh, the favored big uh, uh, steel makers have to make profits. You know? So uh, in as a whole, steel production which reached which zoomed to the level of 800 million uh, tons uh, has uh, dropped. And that is what you call stagnation huh? or a sharp fall. So um, China is being damaged, no? And how is the U.S. damaged by uh, by uh, by the China? For instance, uh, uh, China w uh, has count has countered the U.S. by cutting down its uh, uh, imports of uh, American. Agri uh, American uh, agricultural surplus, you know, they've cut down on uh, uh, soya beans and so on and so forth, you know, exactly uh, where um, uh, Trump has his uh, political base, you know, the Bible Belt uh, 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 crop producing uh, states of the U.S. So there are many, and there are also, uh, China also buys a lot of things from the U.S. So, uh, where in the world will the U.S. get uh, get uh, uh, alternative customers when uh, China uh, stops buying the things uh, it used to buy? China would prefer uh, to buy from elsewhere or try to produce, eh? um, because China is good at uh, um, um, at getting technology from other countries and even developing those technologies. So some observers say China has the national capacity to develop. The, and then there are so many products made in China uh, and the technological processes involved in producing those products are already copied uh, by China and can very well put uh, Chinese brands. Uh, uh, before China used to, you know, to uh, have the confidence trust and confidence of foreign companies. They did not copy in a big way eh? uh, con certain consumer products that are very famous in the, in the, in the Western market. No? But now China knows how to produce those things and they, they intend to put uh, Chinese brands on them. Eh? They, they put a little change in the shape eh, of the Nike shoes, then they mm -hmm. can say, eh, or whatever <laughs> consumer goods. So that's what the, what the US, uh, that is what the, uh, the U.S. was alarmed about <laughs> that, uh, that China was being actually uh, they're being uh, protectionist. So uh, uh, Trump, president of the number one instigator of neoliberalism, <laughs> uh, uh, blew his head and said, oh, uh, uh, we are going to uh, keep up the Chinese and uh, we will do, we will uh, we will uh, 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 do things made in America, but at the same time, you know, he's a crazy. Uh, he's anti-immigrants. Where will he get the? If he drives out the uh, cheap labor, the immigrants. I don't know how he can uh, how can he, he can uh, resuscitate no uh, the consumer uh, manufacturing that had been outsourced to China. Oh, and so and that's a contradiction that uh, that uh, <laughs> uh, he has to face. So there is a mutual, there can be mutual damage between the two. All right, Tito. Next question, naman. Uh, this is from Ash Sulaiman. Good morning, Prof Joma. Individualism seems to be the only thing getting in the way for embracing socialist economy. How do we deal with the people who show such manifestation? Obstinate they may be. 
perhaps even disastrous to an activist or to the mass movement as a whole, say, through personal attacks or etc. You know, uh, <clears throat> uh, individualism as well as recognition of uh, social cooperation are two impulses that are exist in every uh, in everyone, even uh, at the most uh, primitive level of childhood, no? Uh, you know, um, uh, take the case of the relationship between child and mother. Eh? Don't you think the child is a greedy fellow who doesn't do anything and all he asks for would milk eh? and cries out loud when he does not have milk, no? That's one thing. You know? so, you know, also, you might say the child is individualistic. No, it has, it's, uh, it's helpless. It cannot help but be a child and needs milk. No? Okay, so you don't just call it, you don't, just de don't denounce the child as a greedy individualist. No? But you know, the social, the social, what you might call love of the mother and eh, for the child, which is a social thing, he has an obligation. Eh? It's a combination of social obligation and personal love, no? That he must give milk to the child and he must give all kind of support before the child can become, can take care of uh, himself or herself. Yes. You get the point? Uh, those are two impulses in everyone. Now, l let's go to the real facts of uh, uh, the social situation now. So, uh, neoliberalism exaggerated selfishness, greed, what... Uh, uh, what Adam Smith said as the uh, invisible hand of self-interest. He said that greed is what motivates the capitalist, but this results in public good, no? Because they produce goods, no? The role, the productive, the role of the capitalist is exaggerated and obscure, they obscured uh, the creative role of the of, uh, labor power, of the working class, okay? Now, when it comes to neoliberalism, it's not really neoliberalism in the sense, in the classic sense of liberalism. You know, liberalism, um, as it arose from the French Enlightenment uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, took the form of the French Revolution of, uh, of uh, 17, uh, uh, 90 seven to uh, the um, uh, uh, or thereabouts the uh, this uh, uh, this liberalism involved uh, uh, democratic principles you no know? it would um, it asserted uh, the rights of the capitalist entrepreneurs the bourgeoisie uh, um, uh, to operate individually it asserted the right of, uh, of uh, let us say, uh, the intellectual to think freely, individually, and the capitalist to operate individually as an entrepreneur. But uh, um, there was the assertion of the democratic principle of people's sovereignty. And there was the idea of the social contract. And um, people were conceived of as individuals. And uh, the more progressive elements uh, in the French Revolution even had an idea of classes and class struggle. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Marx said that uh, he got the idea of class struggle from the French uh, uh, revolutionaries. Um, so, uh, now what does uh, neoliberalism uh, uh, pontificate and practice? Uh, in uh, the capitalist is the creator of wealth and the creator of jobs, so therefore he must have all the chances uh, to enlarge the capital in his hands, okay? So he has the right to own the capital that he has, he's entitled to tax exemptions, um, and, uh, and then he must be able to press down the wages of workers. Um, he, 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 he must not have the obligation to employ everyone as regular workers. He can reduce the number of uh, regular workers and he can uh, increase, he can decrease the variable capital uh, uh, for wages, no? And then he can, uh, he can privatize 
public assets that are profitable, um, uh, regulations that, that protect uh, we, uh, labor, women, children, and the environment, they must be, uh, uh, they must be removed so that the capitalists will have the free, uh, more freedom no? to exploit uh, natural and human resources. No? And then uh, these uh, uh, dependent countries, they must give up their national economies. They must join. Eh? The, uh, the, capi the neoliberal capitalist network and give up their national rights to patrimony and so on and so forth, okay? So you have the, a complete abuse. And then social services must be cut down eh? because that will uh, reduce the amount of capital uh, for investment by the capitalists. Eh? Uh, you don't require anymore the capitalists to, um, to pay taxes in order to maintain uh, hospitals and uh, schools that are free for the people who are poor. No? Uh, instead, you encourage privatization of the what used to be social services. So that's what happened. No? Now comes COVID-19. <laughs> now, uh, in the richest country, like the United States, people at their loss, they lose their jobs, and then they, when they get sick, they don't have the money to pay uh, the, the hospitals, no? Um, they, they don't have a, they, 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 uh, they, uh, they have practically no uh, public health system. And so, um, neoliberalism has been exposed as antisocial. And um, uh, so there is a call for socialism. So in this, for instance, in the Soviet Union, where there was some, so much abuse, uh, and uh, that in capitalism, and so much was uh, so much uh, of uh, the previous social institutions and practices were removed. No? Uh, right now, 60% uh, of the people in uh, uh, in Russia uh, admire Stalin and would like to have the return of socialism. So they they are now you know the cloud of revisionism. Uh, the uh, the beclouding, the uh, obfuscation of socialism by revisionism uh, is being uh, removed because they know that uh, it resulted in capitalism and capitalism is no good, no? Um, so that's the case. Um, uh, socialism is making a comeback. Uh, according to some statistics, uh, it's worldwide, a worldwide phenomenon. Neoliberalism is proven to be bankrupt. Uh, and um, uh, the emphasis now is on uh, is on socialism and on social methods for solving problems. All right, Keaton. Um, next question would be, um, sorry, um, the OFW remittance are the backbone of the Philippine economy. The number of Filipino migrants, workers are increasing. How does this affect the rest of the industry in the country? Yes, the remittances. Uh, there will be. A, there, there is already a drastic fall in remittances. Uh, you know, uh, if you analyze the composition of uh, uh, overseas uh, uh, Filipino workers, <clears throat> uh, some have uh, uh, definite uh, uh, employment contracts. Uh, you can calibrate them. Some are good, some are not so good, some are bad. And then there is also a big number of undocumented no? uh, uh, migrant workers who are the most subject to uh, removal or exploitation, you know. Uh, to be most clear about that, most of the undocumented are, uh, have the, 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 the most dirty and the most menial types of jobs, you know, the cleaners and so on and so forth. So you will notice in uh, uh, you will notice that in Saudi Arabia, um, there you have a, you find a structure of uh, uh, over uh, of overseas Filipino workers uh, that look like this. So you know the, you have the uh, highest uh, bracket of um, of well-paid uh, Filipinos. You have the doctors, nurses in the hospitals, and then you have the and also you have the engineers and the construction companies, then uh, lower than that, you have uh, 
those who uh, work uh, for um, uh, certain uh, uh, certain companies that provide services, restaurants, and so on and so forth. No? And then you have another layer, construction workers um, uh, that are practically odd jobbers. And you have also plenty of undocumented who take on lowly jobs. Now, um, a great number of these people belong to the lower brackets of the uh, overseas Filipino workers have been uh, have been uh, removed from their jobs by their employers, um, including you know those domestic helpers. Uh, you know even uh, even an ordinary family can hire Filipino work work uh, uh, domestic helpers and maltreat them. You know they they, they mimic you know the the abusive characteristics of their upper class. No. And um, but anyway, uh, see, so uh, they are taking uh, these uh, Filipinos. Many Filipinos now are being taken advantage of, and you see, uh, it's very visible, very conspicuous how people camp out, no? And they even take food, eh? try to look for food in the rubbish, uh, and, and that, that is because of the. Uh, travel restrictions, they cannot be thrown back to the Philippines, even if they are good hearts and uh, willing to fly them out of the Saudi Arabia. So, and then, um, so you, you have these uh, conditions due to COVID-19. But, you know, there are also bad conditions against uh, the migrant workers that are due with or without COVID. Uh, they are against, there are developments against the uh, uh, migrant, Filipino migrant workers, because of the deteriorating condition of capitalism due to the crisis of overproduction. So um, uh, the economies, let's say, the U.S. and European economies, and like other capitalist economies, they have uh, gone down, no? They have declined. And so um, you don't only have a lessened need for the migrant workers, but the ruling class generates certain ultra-reactionary uh, movements. And there are always rascals who try to, you know, please the ruling class and serve themselves up as, uh, you know, fascist and neo-fascist leaders. And so, you know, they use uh, the slogans of fascism, uh, xenophobia, uh, racism, uh, eh? uh, what else, Misogynis uh, misogynism and all sorts of ultra-reactionary currents are uh, uh, thriving, uh, even here in Europe. Um, so, um, the trend, so as the economies here uh, deteriorate, you can expect ultra-reactionary political currents to arise. And so there is really a need for Filipino migrant workers to unite and uh, uh, make sure that their uh, rights and welfare are protected and they can demand from the Philippine government uh, um, uh, ways of uh, being helped in case they're in trouble. But then the Philippine government is not in trouble, is, uh, is not helping because in the first place, um, it, it, it's, its policy is to, cheap, to, to export cheap labor and they have already eh, exhausted um, <clears throat> the funds of OWA have been stolen, mm -hmm. just like the funds of PhilHealth <laughs> have been stolen. <laughs> I just read a meme, no, uh, <clears throat> that is subject to further research. <clears throat> the, the, the money of Bill Health and OWA <clears throat> and so on and so forth, they have been, um, they have been stolen by the Duterte crew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Tito, uh, next question naman, ano. Um, unfortunately, anyway, to our audience, to our 30 plus viewers, um, we are now down to our last two questions from the audience. Unfortunately, we have to close the floor for the questions as uh, we have already um, overdue our time. And uh, we're just going to finish these two questions, which is, uh, Tito, uh, the first one would be, the COVID-19 situation is aggravating the social, political, and economic situation in the country not to mention the mountainous debt that we have, how can we surpass this or how can we pay the country's debt while providing for our kababayans? The debt of the country uh, will continue to rise so long as the ruling system continues. <clears throat> um, 
we like to say <coughs> um, whoever replaces Duterte, even Robredo, um, <coughs> would be a good thing. It would, <coughs> excuse me, it would pr provide relief for the abuses and for the crimes uh, uh, already committed by Duterte. You know, um, <coughs> uh, the Philippines was already sunk in indebtedness, but Duterte made it worse, you know. He stole, yeah. uh, he and his uh, uh, fellows, ra fellow rascals uh, took advantage of COVID-19 to steal hundreds of billions of pesos. <coughs> and they have um, um, increased the foreign debt, indeed. So they, it's a problem how to pay for those debt. But there's just a thing as making revolution and uh, going on default so on those on those uh, on the on those debts provided you can borrow you need to borrow you can borrow from uh, somewhere else no or from someone else <coughs> and um, <coughs> uh, uh, the problem is if uh, someone replaces duterte uh, like uh, aquino eh? replacing uh, marcos uh, aquino you know uh, honor the debts of marcos <laughs> So a silly successor of Duterte can, you know, can also assume eh, the, the foreign debts incurred by Duterte. So uh, uh, what is uh, the situation has become so explosive that um, uh, uh, a constitutional succession occurring soon probably um, is uh, is a good relief, but it is not the final solution. The, con the country will face severe problems. It will continue to be uh, the situation in the Philippines will continue to be explosive. And the only final solution there is uh, to the rottenness of the semi-colonial and semi-ruling system is the People's Democratic Revolution winning victory. And uh, you know there can be an acceleration because. Uh, uh, right there in the Philippines, the rate of uh, deterioration for the system is so fast. And also, on a world scale, in the world, the, the capitalist system is, uh, is in a serious uh, kind of disaster. So, uh, the opportunities for the revolutionary forces and the Filipino people are great. No? So, uh, what can be done uh, in order to struggle against the Duterte regime? Uh, uh, are a stepping stone, uh, constitute stepping stone no? towards the victory of the People's Democratic Revolution. All right. Uh, Tito, our last question for uh, this episode um, is, if the Philippines is not, yet a so is, is not yet a capitalist society, how would you apply Marxist theory of political economy to the Philippine setting? No, in the Philippines... If uh, the Philippines has had commodity, a system of commodity production since the middle of the 19th century, in that sense, you can call it, you can insist on calling it capitalist. But the problem with using the term capitalist is that it is misleading. Um, uh, there is the, those who use the term uh, actually wants to dismiss the term semi-feudal and then imply that the Philippines um, uh, has become industrial capitalist. When, if you say, let us say, you dispense with the term uh, uh, semi-feudalism, okay. Although you can say the Philippines is a capitalist economy um, uh, ruled by a comprador, big bourgeoisie, uh, by a comprador capitalist class, uh, which does not have, uh, which can, does not produce capital goods, but import those capital goods from uh, other countries. That's fine. Huh? If you want to dispense with semi-feudalism, okay. You know, there is, there, is, um, there is precision in the use of the term semi-feudalism as against industrial capitalism. It, um, there is right implication there that there is already capitalism, but it is a comprador a type of capitalism. But you have to stress that the big comprador has a necessary linkage to the landlord class or to feudalism. All the big compradors from Ayala to Cujuanco to Duterte uh, own vast amounts of land, and that is their base. And their base is not, uh, you know, 
industries, but their base is, uh, you know, um, have you, haven't you seen Ayala uh, uh, in the newspapers enjoying their uh, uh, holiday weekend holidays in Kalatagan? They have a vast amount of land there. They used to own um, uh, what they uh, got from the Spaniards in the period of U.S. Uh, land reform, you know, the San Pedro in Nasugbo. Eh? And in coming to, uh, coming to, uh, coming to, Eduardo Cojanco, he owns San Miguel Brewery, which is a big comprador enterprise, you know, the malt uh, used by uh, San Miguel and the equipment all come from abroad. The only thing that comes would, from the Philippines would be the water and the labor power of the Filipino workers. But Cojuanco owns 20 haciendas all over the Philippines, in Isabela, in Pangasinan, in Agusan, in uh, Bogsok Island of Palawan, and so on, 20 hectares. So is that industrial capitalism? No. So. Uh, any term can be used provided it is properly defined. Now, if any, if any, uh, if anyone will just play with the word capitalism to denounce semi-feudalism, he's a stupid. He's trying to mislead people um, because semi-feudal has a certain precision uh, in recognizing that the comprador big bourgeoisie in the Philippines, that um, uh, indeed the comprador big bourgeoisie is dominant in the cities. It's some um, dominant in Ayala. But outside in the provinces, the widespread ruling class is the landlord class. And those uh, rich guys, the big comprador guys in Ayala, own vast amounts of land. So uh, it's not only historically that Ayala uh, was uh, able to uh, own a vast amount of land in Makati by marrying a Chinese woman who owned uh, by the name of Lim and then putting up buildings there. No, Ayala, uh, in, even in that case, Ayala was a landlord and he had lands elsewhere. And uh, what is the use of land, of being feudal in a country like the Philippines now? You use the land as your collateral uh, when you uh, borrow money. If you own the bank, being a comprador, uh, you can... Uh, you can uh, you can apply or the uh, strict rule on other borrowers, but for you, uh, uh, you know there is a uh, you can you can um, um, you can overvalue your land in order to get more a uh, more loan for whatever business you want. That's it. Th uh, that's how uh, that's how the land uh, land basing is important in uh, the phenomenon the capi in the capitalist phenomenon of the comprador big bourgeoisie. Um, you know, there used to be, uh, there used to be the expression comprador, big comprador landlord uh, to show uh, clearly the linkage of the kind of bourgeoisie that you have ruling in the Philippines. But then some people would say, oh, let's be Marxist, let's determine which is the chief uh, class between the two. Yeah? Although they are, you know, the linkage is very necessary between the two. But if you, have, you really have to single out the chief exploiting class in the Philippines or the chief ruling class in the Philippines, it's the comprador of big bourgeoisie. They are the most powerful. Those who control the banks and the biggest trading uh, firms and some import-dependent uh, 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 import dependent, uh, uh, enterprises engaged most likely in some semi-processing. All right. Yeah, I think Tito Joe, um, that is the last question uh, on our list already. And um, mga kasama, um, we have ended already the discussion for um, the basic principles of Marxism and Leninism on political economy. No. Um, so, uh, mga kasama, stand by 
po tayo next week on our discussion, the basic principles of Marxism and Leninism on political, on, sorry, on scientific socialism. That is on August 30, 2020. Same time, same place. So make sure to note this on your calendars and catch, catch updates on our Facebook group, ND Line Online, or our Facebook page, Anak Bayan Europa, for more updates. Before we close, everyone, we would just like to plug in um, a, the Foreign Language Press uh, online store. So this is a online store for books where you could find also the book for the basic principle for Marxism and Leninism um, by Tito Jo and um, other scriptures as well and other books that you can find. Um, so if you could just visit the, ve the website, flpress.storenv.com, you could see the actual website. So the, uh, the books are really cheap and it is really good. So it is a must that you visit and order, uh, drop your orders on foreign language press, foreign language press now. So, uh, mga kasama, ulit, um, for more updates, visit our Facebook page, Nakbayan Europa, or our, our standby on our Facebook group, ND Line Online. Huwag kalimutan mag-like, mag-share, at mag-imbita upang sumali sa ating makabuluhan at nakamumulat na talakayan dito lang sa National Democratic Online School, Series with Tito Joe. Muli, maraming salamat po sa pakikibahagi. Ako po si Kasamang Christ. Uh, kasama si Tito Joe. Tito Joe, may gusto po ba kayong uh, sabihin before we end? Well, uh, um, I would like to thank uh, everyone participating uh, in this webinar. And as, as, as I always say, I hope the issues are clarified. And, um, uh, and I hope that the clarification sheds light on the path to uh, militant action. Um, yes, uh, understanding should mean um, uh, resol um, should result in resoluteness and in militant action. To our audience, thank you so much again for participating. For our uh, viewers who is really interactive on today's episodes, I wish uh, next week samahan niyo po ulit kami and uh, maging, magkaroon po kayo ng uh, maging active sa pag pakikibahagi kasama namin ni Tito Jo. Uh, yun po ulit, ako po si Kasamang Christ, kasama si Tito Jo. Mapagpalayang gabi po para sa ating lahat.